Autism is part of the human condition. And it probably always has been, although in recent times it is sharply on the rise. Here are a few faces of some of the wonderful children and young adults that we've had the pleasure of interacting with. And here's some prevalence numbers that are quite staggering of increase in diagnosis rate of autism in America, culminating in this staggering number of one in 68. And we don't know why this is. Likewise, technology has probably also been part of the human condition forever as assistive devices to make life better and easier across the human condition. So here are some adoption rates of cell phone use even in India. So there are those who fear technology and who say that technology is dividing us, that perhaps we are evolving to a place where we are becoming less human. Well, I'll give one example today of our work where we are using technology conspicuously to bolster the core concepts of the human condition and in a highly human-centric way. And that is namely the brain power system, our system, to empower people with autism to train themselves towards self-sufficiency. As you see, it's based on wearable technology, currently Google Glass, and scalable to that which will come next. These are those same children and young adults we just saw, but immediately after their first experience with the system. And that look of joy and delight is just, just amazing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, as an example, our application of wearable technology and Internet of Things to autism. Some of our philosophies like micro-customization, gamification, uh, big data, predictive neural analytics. And then our view of a, of a future in which all of this is so seamless it just melts away and is completely invisible. And use these to comment on maybe larger, wider topics such as this, that technology can actually make us more human, not less, even if our current technologies are trapped somewhere in what could be termed an uncanny valley, which I'll discuss later. So after PhD and postdoc, I decided I wanted to apply my science to practical, uh, to daily life, to help people. And so I started a company and a nonprofit with the twin goals of, on the one hand, helping transform how people with autism see and interact with the world, and on the part of the nonprofit, how helping transform how the world sees, interacts with, and can decode people with autism. Why? Well, those numbers I mentioned are absolutely staggering. One in 68, and in fact, in boys who far outnumber girls with autism, it's one in 40. So that's greater than 2% of your population. And sadly and shamefully, the medical system has no effective intervention for autism. Nothing that will modify the, the outcome of autism per se. And the educational system is stretched too thin and we don't have solutions for these parents. But the one thing that does work is direct, structured, human-human interaction. Life coaching. But it's effortful and it requires that highly trained other human being which means it's very expensive and inaccessible for many families. And this is the perfect grounds for intervention of technology, where we can bring in something that embodies the knowledge and learning of that human interactor and fortifies what the brain learns and how it learns. So you, you've heard of Google Glass. And maybe you think of it as a wearable phone, essentially, a notification device. But we've used it in a creative way that actually Google, who've invited me to speak nine times on campus, have said is the most creative and impactful use. And why would they say that? Well, 
there's a tremendous computer just inside this device, and it also has a nine-axis accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. And just as a preview, and I'll explain why it matters, we use that to measure the head motions 100 times a second. So we can ask, when mom calls the child's name, does he look? Does he make eye contact? An assessment, if assessment tells us what is the desired, then why shouldn't assessment also morph into therapy or treatment and in that sense, that which we measure and which is clinically used to assess, we then routinize and reinforce in a gamified way and make that the intervention. So what is autism? Sadly, we don't have an answer to that question. It's probably one word for many, many conditions. You could say autism spectrum disorder is like limping disorder. There are many reasons why someone might be limping. Sure, a crutch might help each of them, but they got there for a different reason and they'll get from there for a different reason. So we punt and we don't say what autism is, but what we do is break it down into some key features. Life skills. Recognizing the emotions of others, speaking, conversing, and that's beyond just language into how close to stand, how loudly to speak, and so forth. Self-control of behaviors and Eye contact, a simple social grace, but it teaches your brain what the other person is thinking and feeling and gives them the notification that you're paying attention. So we make games for social engagement. Now here's a one frame shot of what I'll show you next as a captured demo, but in this case, the person wearing glass experiences the world in an augmented way. When I look at you, I'll see what your expression is painted in an emoticon. To the right or to the left, this is a private experience for the wearer. And I tilt my head one way or the other and choose, and then I, have, I get a point for getting it right. So it's a gamified and private experience. We're using complex analytics. We're using advanced math to detect faces, to analyze them, but we're giving a very simplified experience to the person. So here's that in action. I'll do that one more time and narrate it a little bit. So Sean puts on glass, looks at his mom, gets the screen, chooses the app. This is a motion game. And then when he sees her, he gets these two emoticons, tilts his head, chooses the right one, gets it correct, gets a point. Now this is real time. Uh, this is the people in his actual life, and he can review it later. Now, this one is an ongoing decode, so during a conversation you could get real-time analysis and look at how rapidly it responds, happy, sad, and so forth. That's just one. We have a suite of, of these modules. The point being each one is a life skill, and it's a life skill not just for autism, but for life. Aren't these interview skills? Aren't these skills that help us get a date, get a job, and so forth? The next one, what's this? People with autism tend to struggle to make eye contact. We don't know why. Is it motivational? Is it a lack of information or what? But one thing they do love are, are Disney and other cartoon characters. So we detect faces, repaint them in real time, for instance, with a copyright-free angry bird, and catch their attention. When we have their attention, then they get a point for making eye contact, and we measure the performance. So again, here's that in real time with Ryan. He's excited, he pays attention, and then when he finally gets her directly in the field of view, he's getting points for the duration of eye contact. It's highly engaging. I've had kids play this with me, and they want to get the high score, and it goes on and on and on. I'm like, okay, it's, it's okay now. We, we can stop. And then I'm looking away, and the kid says, no, no, make eye contact. Keep looking at me. So I'm getting told by the kid to do so. It's very engaging. We want to use the natural tendencies of gamification. Why is it that children can recite the baseball statistics or 
European football statistics of 100 players or team members and not a single physics equation. We don't fully know why, but we know there's a disconnect in how we teach information. We're trying to use the natural competitiveness and gamification to teach the skills that these people want to learn in order to engage better with those around them. We've tested many children around the country. We actually bought an RV and traveled around the US this summer and visited communities where they are rather than making them come to us and found a great deal of homogeneity in the experience. And that experience really includes one of pain. These parents are wondering, what happens when I die? Who will take care of my, my child? Should I be building a college fund or should I be building out the basement? They don't know and they want numerical answers. And what we haven't been able to give until now are numerical, quantitative, uh, objective assessments and training tools and a measure of how well is this person doing. The media have been very kind to us. We've won a lot of awards for the science, for the app, for kid-facing tools, and, and from the community itself, from the autism community. But what's really important, our currency is smiles. And it's transformations like this, Kendall, a shy girl putting on the device, seeing something anew that her parents don't see. It's her private world, and it's engaging, and it's fun. And this is a girl who doesn't usually smile, just completely lost in that experience. And that is what we're experiencing and what the payoff is. And again, why technology can bring us out into the world and help us be even more human rather than less. And I'll make the point that before this session, she was down on her iPad, lost in it. We have to remember that technology can go either way, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Now, if we have the sound here. And it's a life coach that is on. It's not meds, you know? It's, it's like a life coach. It, and it's a life coach that is on you. So Rob is one of our parents, and he makes a very important point. This is not a medicine. This is not drugs that can cause its own type of addiction. This is a life coach, and it's a wearable life coach. Now, uh, I miss, there should have been a slide I missed here that poses the question, you know, can technology make us more human uh, or less? And I would say that there are those, not in this room, who are very afraid that technology will keep us separated from each other. We are the rarefied few who've traveled across the world to be here to giddily revel in emerging technologies. I, in fact, came all the way from America on my birthday, which it is today. <laughs> totally shameless of me to do that. Anyway, um, we are the choir here. But there are those who worry deeply about the topic of technology and separation. And in fact, it can go either way. It is a matter of how we implement it, and in fact, it's a matter of our brains. I think we're very well aware that our brains can be tricked into wanting things that are not good for them. Take the example of illicit drugs, where a drug is a substance that our brain wants and seeks incommensurately with its value. We want it more than it's good for us. And we know that we fall prey to drug. Take Las Vegas. Vegas is a 50, or I don't know, $500 billion shrine to how miscalculated our sense of reward and risk is. So our brains can be fooled. So we know it is possible for us to create technologies that we want, that we seek, that are not actually good for our brains. But we know that they can be amazing. And it needs to be a moral calculus at every step to know that we're going down the right stage. And that, I would say, for, for one, with the iPads, with the other things that we put in front of a child or put a child in front of, from television to, to phones, they're down. They're in the other world. They're not in the current world. With something like Google Glass, they're heads up, hands-free, and engaged. 
and they actually need another human being to get a point. So it's encouraging the behavior, and the reward is the endogenous reward. It's the social connection. But that's not really enough. We need to go a little bit further. What can we get out of a device like this and Internet of Things and so forth? You may not know that Glass has an infrared camera that's looking at me at all times, and we can measure blink rate that we have a patent pending technology to use the microphone and the accelerometer and so forth to listen for breathing and heart rate. So we're measuring physiology. Goal is predict and prevent meltdowns. Goal is figure out what are the subcategories of autism. As I mentioned, one word for hundreds of conditions potentially, we don't have a data-driven way of compartmentalizing autism. Like many things in healthcare, but especially mental health, we don't have anything but a syndromological description. And so the future is one in which we can determine, are you subtype L or Q of whatever condition you have, and therefore what interventions should be delivered. But even more and beyond that, that's something that we can get from a very vigilant inspection of, of the data from the person. And we should always be uh, continually monitored. But then there is another stage. Um, let's see if I have. Yeah, so this is the worry that we, we get lost in our devices. But I would say right now, all the best of our technologies are still locked in an uncanny valley. Who knows what uncanny valley refers to? It's the sense that during a progression, as you near the goal, you actually fall off a cliff before coming back and then reaching that goal. This is one way of describing it. So nearly photorealistic cartoon characters look irksome if their face moves slightly differently than it should because we've now said, okay, this is real, and then it suddenly fails to be real and it's a problem. Language learning. You learn five words of Chinese, you can get through a restaurant, you learn a hundred sentences, people say, wow, good on you. you, you've done well. Now you get to nearly conversant but are making grammatical errors all over the place and people think you're just dumb because you're good enough to speak the language, but not very well. And I think right now our technologies have come a long way from, for instance, the predecessor to Google Glass. And I'm obviously a fan of Glass and think it's pretty amazing, but it still is cumbersome. It still is a bit in the way. And so we're in that uncanny valley, but we're close. We're very close with our technologies. What they will look like, well, is like this which is just a picture of a girl, because that's what the future will be like. It will be in a contact lens, it will be in the ear canal, it will be, uh, hopefully we'll solve some of our battery woes and we can have a tiny micro cell that lasts for a week. It will be transparent and melted into the human existence, the human body, and therefore into the human condition. So the future of brain empowerment, of technological empowerment, is an invisible future. So technology steps out of the way and we step even further forward into each other's lives. So I believe I will end. Empower us. Come back with our um, message of empowerment from Brain Power, a series of people telling us the positive message. Empower us. Empower us. Empower us. Empower us. Empower us. Empower us. Thank you.